in my last lecture we have discussed about the diffusion as i mentioned earlier that there are two techniques which are usually used for the doping in semiconductor one is diffusion another is ion implantation but remember that this type of diffusions or ion implantation is used to form junction generally not to diffuse the whole material not to dope the whole material okay during crystal growth i shall show you that during crystal growth the doping is made suppose you want to make silicon n type or p type so it is made during the crystal growth itself by adding required amount of arsenic or phosphorus or boron etc but you, if you have a p type material or an n type material and you want to dope it by n type or p type for the formation of a pn junction or some for device fabrication like say cmos etc then you need this kind of either diffusion or ion implantation so uh, since we have covered the diffusion earlier so now we shall start implantation ion implantation so as the name implies you will find that ion implantation is nothing but the implantation of ion inside the material so the process involved will be first you have to take a material suppose you would like to dope by boron so you have to take boron then that boron has to convert into ion then its mass and energy must be yes and finally it will fall on the surface of the substrate or the wafer on which you want to dope so this is a process and you know that the ion implantation process is done by some ion implanter <coughs> using some cyclotron or that type of a machine so in this view graph i have given some introduction on ion implantation you will find that ion implantation is nothing but the introduction of energetic charged particles into a substrate and the energy i have written that it is a introduction of energetic so what is the energy the energy of the beam must be 1 kev to 1 mev okay 1 kev to 1 mev now what is kev and to mev kev is kilo electron volt and what is mev mega electron volt 10 to the power 6 so the energy is very very high you find that normal electron volt is very less amount of energy the band gap of silicon is 1.12 electron volt but if you consider the implantation then it is very very high of the order of 1 mev and another thing is that what is the average depth that can the ion beam penetrate it is from 10 nanometer to 10 micron so deep inside the material it can reach okay minimum can be 10 nanometer and inside it can be 10 micron also <coughs> and the ion dose the dose is defined as the number of ions implanted into 1 cm square surface area okay so number of ions implanted into 1 cm square of surface area if this is the definition of the dose then the ion dose is basically 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 18 ions per centimeter square remember per centimeter square okay so if you have a wafer of say 2 inch or 4 inch or 8 inch diameter then you convert the area using the formula pi r square because it is almost uh, uh, circular in shape so you use that pi r square formula and then you convert the total number of ions etc now this ion implantation has some distinct advantages over diffusion process distinct advantages over diffusion process and uh, one thing is that the advantage is that ion implantation is done at very lower temperature low power processing temperature in diffusion we have seen that how much temperature it needs of the order of 1000 degree centigrade 1200 degree centigrade 
So, very high amount of energy is associated for diffusion. Okay. But you know that for diffusion the energy is dissipated for the formation of the vacancy as well as the movement of the impurity atom inside the crystal lattice. Okay. So, for that reason you must enhance the temperature and we have seen that for silicon the temperature is almost 1000 degree centigrade. right? But for ion implantation you see that the processing temperature is low, low means it is almost room temperature, almost room temperature. Another thing is that more precise control of the amount of dopant, control is very precise in this case because you can measure the beam current. This dose or the amount of dopant can be controlled by the beam current. Okay. One parameter is there, it is known as the beam current and using the beam current you can control very precisely and using a mathematical uh, problem I shall show you that how the beam current is measured and how the beam current is related to the dose and more reproducible doping profile. In case of diffusion sometimes we find that during diffusion the doping profile can change depending on the temperature, depending on the dose, depending on the surface concentration. So, profile can change, profile means the trajectory inside the material from the surface to the maximum depth it has covered. Okay. So, these are the advantages of ion implantation. Remember that the most important advantage is the low temperature. <coughs> Another thing is that uh, advantage is that the doping layers can be implanted without disturbing previously diffused regions. Previously diffused regions means suppose you have a material already n type doped you want to make a p n junction. So, you have to dope the material with p type. Now, if the temperature is increased, so what will happen? Already there is a doping inside the material because it was already n type. So, those dopant atoms can change their position inside the material. As you go on increasing the temperature during diffusion, so what will happen to the already diffused atom? They can also move. So, that means the crystal structure can change. So, that is the thing that in ion implantation you can dope without disturbing previously diffused region. Okay. Suppose already there is a small region, say you, have, you want to make a shallow junction. So, already there is a say 1 micron or 0.1 micron p layer is there, but if you further increase the temperature by say 100 degree, 1000 degree centigrade then what will happen? That p region which was earlier say 0.1 micron, it will move deep inside the material. So, you cannot control the depth. So, this is the advantage that in implantation without disturbing the previously diffused region because of the low temperature associated during implantation. <coughs> and as I have uh, already introduced the term ion beam current and we discussed that the ion beam current can be measured accurately during implantation. So, precise control of doping concentration is possible. So, these are the advantage of ion implantation over diffusion. Now, ion implantation is made using an ion implanter. There is a machine which is known as the ion implanter. It is basically a cyclotron type of machine using which the material ion is first produced, it is accelerated, then it is scanned through some electrostatic deflection okay, and then it is implanted on the surface of the material. Say this is the surface of the material, so the beam will come and it will be accelerated, then you can scan the beam, you can scan the beam mean, means where it will fall, here or here or there, so you can scan or the whole surface area you can scan and then it will <coughs> penetrate inside the material through the surface and then it will come to rest after travelling certain distance. 
here the ion source is one of the import important uh, component of an ion implanter. Let me uh, show you the ion implanter. This is the ion implanter machine. This is a huge machine and very costly machine. You see that there is an ion source, here is, there is an ion source. So, first you have to make the ion from the source material. So, that means for ion source heated filament is used to break up source gas into charged ions. So, you have to take a gas say it is BF 3 or ASH 3 right that gas you have to break into charged ions by using some heated filament and the ion will be produced either B plus or AS plus depending on the nature of the ion you will find the ions. Then there is an extraction voltage 40 kV very high voltage you see that this is the 40 kV voltage which is connected with the ion source. So, this 40 kV extraction voltage causes charged ions to move out of the ion source chamber into a mass analyzer. That means that voltage is used to move it outside from the ion source to the mass analyzer. Then there is a magnetic field to choose only ions with the desired mass to charge ratio because for ion it is very important you have to choose the mass to charge ratio. And then it is sent to the acceleration tube it is accelerated to the implantation energy. So, this is the process that first there is a ion source then you make the ion you analyze the ion and then this is the acceleration tube through which it will pass it will it can, you, you can accelerate the ion to proper energy. <coughs> then there is apertures which ensures well collimated ion beam so that it does not get deflected. Okay. If it is get deflected then the control will be very difficult. So, that is why there is a collimated ion beam and you see that this is the this uh, collimation is there so that the aperture this aperture you can control the uh, diameter of the aperture uh, as per your requirement it depends on the uh, diameter of the ion beam you can increase the diameter you can decrease the diameter suppose you want to fall the ion beam into say 1 centimeter square or it can be say 10 centimeter square depending on your requirement. So, you can change the aperture as well. And another important consideration is the pressure that pressure inside the chamber inside the accelerator is must be it, it must be 10 to the power minus 4 Pascal a very very small pressure to minimize ion scattering by gas molecules because if if it, it is not evacuated then what will happen there will be gas molecules inside the tube inside the tube there will be gas molecules. So, when the ion beam will travel through the gas molecules it will be scattered. So, it will be scattered so it, it can lose its energy the direction can be changed by scattering. So, that is why care must be taken so that the acceleration tube or the uh, tube through which the ion beam is passing is almost evacuated that is why 10 to the power minus 4 Pascal less than this is required. And then the ion beam is scanned over the wafer surface using electrostatic deflection plates. And finally, the energetic ions lose energy by collision with either electrons and nuclei in the substrate and finally, come to rest at some depth within the lattice. The most important thing of the ion implantation is this part that means, the how the energetic ions will lose their energy. There must be collision inside the material. So, inside the material what type of collision can be done? What kind of collision can be made? One is that the in an atom there is a cloud of electron. Okay. So, there can be scattering with the electrons. Okay it will collide with the electrons or it can collide with the nuclear. So, there are two possibilities and we shall show that it depends on the energy whether it will collide with the nucleus or with the electron cloud. <coughs> now, 
Now, you want to make a junction. So, what should be the junction depth from the surface, how it can be controlled? It can be controlled by the acceleration energy. It can be 10 keV, it can be 100 keV, it can be 1 MeV. So, depending on the acceleration energy, it will travel the distance inside the material. And the dose will be controlled by monitoring the ion current during implantation. But there is side effect. For diffusion, we do not have any side effect. Here, there is a side effect, and the side effect is the damage of the crystal lattice. The damage of the crystal lattice. Suppose we are working with silicon, you are in, you would like to implant something inside silicon. So, silicon crystals had some has some atomic arrangements and it has some precise energy if you give that energy the atoms can be displaced or replaced like the creation of vacancy etcetera. We have shown that how much energy is required during the vacancy type of diffusion. So, now here the energy is very very high severely high. So, what will happen? It will collide and during collision all thing will be damaged inside the material it will be damaged okay? and because of this damage sometimes the crystalline material because all semiconductor device is processed using crystalline material bearing a few. I shall give those examples also almost all electronic device you need crystalline very single crystal material high purity very high purity single crystal material. Now, if you use an ion implanter and it damages your crystal structure inside the material. So, what will happen basically the crystalline structure can be converted into amorphous even can be converted into amorphous even. So, if it is converted to amorphous, then what will happen? Your ultimate goal cannot be achieved, because the ultimate goal is to use some device, to use that material for fabrication of some device. So, for that crystalline is required, why amorphous is not used? Can you tell me? Why we are scared about amorphous state? for semiconducting materials. What is the difference between crystalline and amorphous? Basically, for an amorphous material, it is completely random arrangements of atoms in the crystal lattice. Okay? There is no periodicity, it is completely random and due to that randomness, the scattering will be very, very high. So, if the electron scattering is very, very high, then the mobility will fall, mobility will decrease. So, that is the reason amorphous material is not used for normal electronic device. It has some other applications, amorphous is also used, I shall show you in some particular application in say solar cell, in Xerox machine, those materials are also useful but not for electronic device application. So, <coughs> you see that the side effect is disruption or damage of the semiconductor lattice due to ion collision. And to remove the damage annealing is done. So, what is annealing? Annealing is nothing but what is annealing? Annealing is heating. Okay, at a particular temperature for a particular time period, if you heat the material under certain ambience, so it will restructure okay, inside the material the atoms will restructure its themselves. The material will restructure itself to its original situation, original phase. That means, if the crystallinity changes, then using annealing crystallinity will regain. So, that is the side effect and the side effect can be uh, treated as well. <coughs> okay, now, some definition, 
total distance that an ion travels in coming to rest is called its range. Total distance that an ion travels in coming to rest is called its range, total distance is range. So, that means this is the range, this is the range. You see that this is surface, this is surface and from surface to deep inside the material, it is a, it is a trajectory inside the material remember. So, that is the range, this is the ion range and the projection of this distance along the axis of incidence is called projected range. So, one is range, another is projected range, the projected range is nothing but the projection of this distance along the axis of incidence. So, this is range and this is projected range, R p is the projected range that means it is the along the axis. So, that means R p is the minimum distance. R p is the minimum distance from the point of incidence to the point of final penetration or termination of the ion beam. Suppose the ion beam is penetrated at this point, the incident point is here and it has moved through this trajectory and finally come to rest here. So, along the axis the distance is known as the projected range right and uh, another thing is the statistical fluctuations in the projected range are called projected straggle. So, we shall use projected range and projected straggle, straggle means statistical fluctuations because you know that the mass and charge is different, the energy you can control. So, different ion will reach at different time different position. So, there will be a statistical distribution of the ion inside the material. That is why that statistical fluctuations in the projected range are called projected straggle S T R A G G L E. <coughs> yes, so, this is the range and this is the straggle, this thing is straggle that means this sigma p is the straggle sigma p is the struggle. Okay. Now, the implanted impurity profile using an ion implanter will take the shape of Gaussian distribution. Okay. People have calculated and the concentration or the ion dose is given by S by root 2 pi sigma p, sigma p is the struggle that means this is the statistical fluctuation exponential minus x minus r p whole square by twice sigma p square. What is S? S is the ion dose per unit area, ion dose per unit area, sigma p is the straggle, r p is the projected range, r p is the projected range. So, if you write down this expression for the profile this is remember this is for the ion implantation. Okay. Now, if you can compare with the diffusion profile, so what you will find? If you can compare with the diffusion profile, so this is the implantation, this profile is due to the implantation, just now you have write down the value this expression and the and the for diffusion this is the expression that we have deduced in the last class. C S pi root pi d t exponential minus x square by 4 d t. So, this is for diffusion and that is for ion implantation. Now, what is the difference or is there any similarity between them? Obviously, there is some similarity between them. If you find that this expression you just replace 4 d t by 2 sigma p square, this 4 d t and this 2 sigma p square, if you can replace this 4 d t by 2 sigma p square, then it will assume the same shape like the upper one, except that there is a shift in the distribution 
earlier it was at x, now it will be x minus r p. Okay? So, there are two important approximation that you can make if you can understand the doping profile of the implantation with the diffusion. Yes. Yes. Which one? Root dt? Sigma p is outside. Yes. Sigma p is outside this sigma p is always outside. Okay. So, if you compare these two relations, so you will find that if 4 d t is replaced by 2 sigma p square and x is shifted along and, and the distribution shifted along x axis by r p, then these two things will be similar. Now, one thing we have discussed in our earlier lecture is that for diffusion, the peak concentration will be at the surface, but for ion implantation it will be inside the material okay, for some distance there will be a peak. So, now you can explain that observation using these two relation why for diffusion this expression is maximum when x equals to 0, when x equals to 0 then C is maximum. So, that means the maximum concentration will be at the surface and it is maximum when x equals to r p. For this expression, this expression is maximum when x equals to r p. So, r p is not x equals to 0, r p is not obviously x equals to 0. So, now if you can move to our earlier slides, you can see that the changes you see in this relay in this view graph you see that here it was maximum at x equals to 0. Here the maximum was not at x equals to 0, but for some position r p. So, this is r p this peak is at r p. Okay? Now, it is clear why the maximum concentration was at the surface for diffusion and at r p for ion implantation. It is because of the expression we have used for the doping profile. <coughs> yes. 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 Huh? If 2 sigma square equals to 4 d t, then it is matching, why it is not matching? Which one? It is matching obviously, it is matching 4 d t, it is, it is completely matching, okay. that is not the problem, you come to my office, I shall show you. Then ion stopping that is important consideration that how the ion beam will be stopped inside the material. There are two mechanisms by which an energetic ion on entering a semiconductor target can be brought to rest. So, the semiconductor which the implantation is made is known as the target. Okay, the semiconductor surface or the semiconductor wafer on which you want to implant the material is known as the target. So, when ion beam will incident on the target, so it will come to rest by two mechanism. One is by transferring energy to target nuclei. It causes deflection of incident ion beam, displaces many target nuclei from their lattice sites it is like the collision of two hard spheres. It is a collision of two hard spheres like this thing, you see that this is your target with m m 2, it is at rest and this is your 
ion beam of mass m 1 energy is 0 moving along with v 0 velocity. So, if they collide what will happen? Yes. So, they will scatter here the m 1 will move to that direction and the host atom will move through another direction it will with v 1 it is will v 2 etcetera. Right. So, one thing is that by transferring energy to target nuclei and it will cause deflection to the incident beam you see that the beam was in this direction, but there was a deflection theta. So, now the beam is going with a making an angle theta with its own original direction. So, there is a deflection and it displaces many target nuclei from their lattice site like this it was this nuclei was at this point it is displaced now to this side. Obviously, because the energy is very very high and so you can expect that side type of a situation will happen during ion implantation. Another is the interaction of ion with the cloud of electrons surrounding the target's atom. So, ion loses energy in collision with electrons and electrons can be excited to higher levels or can be ejected. That means, either there will be excitation of electrons from lower level to higher level or the ionization can be possible. That means, the it can eject from its own position depending on the energy value. So, these two situation can happen one is the collision with the nuclei for which both the nuclei and the atom will be both the nuclei and the ion will be displaced from their original direction and another is the collision with the electrons for which the electrons will gain energy they will move from lower energy state to higher energy state or they can be ionized as well. Okay? Because you, you see that if you implant with say 10 keV or 100 keV of ion beam then it is a huge energy and that energy if you stop that ion beam so where the energy will go. So, energy will be transferred to the nuclei or to the electron and they will obviously energized and for that ener energy uh, gain you have some consequence one is the deflection another is the ionization. Here you uh, see that uh, there are three ion we have used one is arsenic this is arsenic this is phosphorus and this is boron okay boron phosphorus and arsenic three ions we have used in silicon obviously it is silicon and this solid line is due to nuclear energy loss and dotted line is the electronic energy loss for silicon the electron energy loss is this dotted line, but for nuclear energy loss there are three different lines for three different nuclei. Okay. For why electronic energy loss is not different who can tell only one curve we have shown for the electronic energy loss. It is because it is very simple because the electron yes it is it is for the silicon only. Okay, if the boron or the phosphorus or the arsenic or whatever be the ion is stopped by the electrons whose electrons are it is silicon. So, for silicon the energy is same that is why that is the curve the dotted curve is there for electronic energy loss. But for nuclear, they are also the silicon nucleus is involved, but two bodies involved one is the ion of phosphorus with silicon or the ion of boron with silicon or the ion of arsenic with silicon. So, three different curves are there. 
Now, what we find from this curve? Why we are interested about this curve? It is because you see that when the energy of implantation is low, when the energy of implantation is low, you see in the x axis we have plotted the energy. So, when the energy is say this 10, 10 kV or even less, what we find? that the energy loss will be due to electronic. The energy loss will be here electronic. Then if you increase the energy for boron, you see that for boron the curve is at the lowest position. So, the if you increase the energy say 400 kV. So, this 400 kV is basically this position. So, it will be electronic energy loss, it will be electronic energy loss. So, far as the boron is concerned it will be electronic energy loss. Now, if you take phosphorus as an example, so beyond 130 kV, beyond 130 kV the loss was due to <coughs> nuclear, but if you cross 130 kV the loss will be due to the electronic, but for arsenic till 700 kV the loss will be due to nuclear only and above 700 kV the loss will be electronic. So, as you go on increasing the atomic mass boron, phosphorus and arsenic if you compare the atomic mass obviously, boron has the lowest and arsenic has the highest. So, as the atomic mass increases you will find that the trend the loss will be more and more electro uh, more and more nuclear. For boron it is almost above 10 kV it is fully electronic. For phosphorus above 130 kV it is electronic and for 700 kV arsenic it is electronic above 700 right. So, this is the implication that the stopping of the ion beam inside the material will entirely depend on the energy of the ion beam and the ion itself. If the ion is say arsenic and you are using say 400 kV, so what you will expect? If the ion beam is arsenic and you are implanting at 400 kV, it will be nuclear. So, all the energy will be lost during the nuclear collision, right. Similarly, if you consider that say you are using the 600 kV ion beam of phosphorus it will obviously electronic right. So, people have calculated graph is available data is available and you can see whether it will be electronic or nuclear. <coughs> then the drawback of this implantation, the drawback of this implantation is that it can cause damage, it can cause damage. Electronic collisions do not displace semiconductor atoms from their lattice position obviously, because atom is not involved for electronic collision only electrons are involved. So, there will be no displacement of atom in the crystal lattice for electronic collision, but for nuclear collision host atoms are displaced causing implant damage or lattice disorder. Displaced atoms processing uh, possessing sufficient energy may cause secondary displacement of nearby atoms which is known as cascading to form a tree, tree of disorder along the ion path, right. What is this? Now, a ion beam is colliding with a nucleus the ion beam was say 1 mega electron volt or say 400 kilo electron volt. So, it will transfer its energy to the nucleus. 
then that nuclear energy will be increased. So, it will collide with the neighboring nucleus, okay? some energy will be transferred to the neighboring nucleus, then that neighboring nucleus is energized now. So, it will collide with a third nucleus. So, unless the whole energy is dissipated by this collision, there will be cascading effect. That is why I have written that secondary displacement of nearby atoms that is known as the cascading. Okay? And because of this cascading, a tree of disorder along the ion path will be observed, tree of disorder. You see what is the tree of disorder? Yes, this is the tree of disorder. Here this is you see in the first figure, figure A, there is a light ion beam and it has travelled through the region. Obviously, after certain distance there will be some damage or during its travel along this axis there will be some displacement or some damage as well. This is like a tree okay, with branches and leaves and flowers etcetera it look like a tree that is why it is known as the tree of disorder. But if there is a heavy ion you will find that the damage will be from the onset of implantation. Okay? You see that this is within this RP that means the projected range the whole material formed a disorder cluster and the thickness of that disorder cluster is not less. So, far as the semiconductor dimension is concerned it is 50 angstrom, it is 50 angstrom. So, it is not very less if you consider that quantum well case for gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide quantum well, we shall discuss those things. What should be the well thickness? The well thickness will be 60 angstrom, 50 angstrom, 40 angstrom. So, that means this 50 angstrom dimension is not less in semiconductor. So, that means a huge region though it is confined to 50 angstrom, but for semiconductor it is huge region. Okay? there will be tree of disorder and because of this disorder you find that in some cases the materials can even become amorphous. Okay. Yes. <coughs> so, how to cure those damage? Damage can be cured using annealing. On implantation semiconductor may become amorphous to restore mobility and other material parameters and to activate the implanted ions annealing is done. Another term we have used activate the implanted ion. What is the meaning of this term to activate the implanted ion? Activation means you have to supply energy because ion atom is there, ion is there, but for its activation some amount of energy is required so that it can give away its electron or form the bond etcetera. Otherwise, you will not get the free electron. Your ultimate aim is to increase the free electron. What is your aim for doping? that means free electron, the number of free electrons you have to increase. So, if you want that the donor will donate one free electron to the system, then activation of the ion or the atom must be done and for that some amount of energy is required, that energy is supplied by the annealing, because annealing is the heating of the material. Plus sir, what point the purpose of annealing is first? Yes, exactly, 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 exactly. Because for for activation, the energy is very very small, so it will get from the atmosphere as well, from the material itself at higher temperature. For activation, you need not to use some 600, 700, 1000 degree centigrade. 
for activation it is 40 degree, 50 degree, 60 degree sufficient. Okay. So, so, there are two types of annealing, one is known as the conventional annealing, another is known as the rapid thermal annealing. One is the conventional annealing, another is the rapid thermal annealing which is known as the RTA, rapid thermal annealing. In conventional annealing basically you have to use a furnace and you have seen how a furnace looks like with a heavy mass. The thermal mass of a conventional furnace is very very large because you know that the furnace is the volume of furnace is very very large. So, long time and high temperature is required to remove damages, long time and high temperature. Why long time and high temperature? Why long time and high temperature is required? Because you cannot increase the temperature very quickly. That, that means, thermal gradient say if you want to increase the temperature by 100 degree centigrade per second, it is not possible using your conventional furnace, 100 degree centigrade per second, 300 degree centigrade per second. Very quickly you want your temperature to raise by say raise to 1000 degree centigrade. Okay. So, within 2 second, 3 second, 4 second you have to increase the temperature of the furnace. Then why the temperature must be very quickly raised? What is the rationale behind this statement? Yes, one thing is thermal shock, another thing is that say for gallium arsenide, the arsenic will evaporate. If for a long time you would like to increase the temperature from 30 degree room temperature to 1000 degree, say if it takes 30 minutes or 40 minutes, then what will happen? The arsenic will evaporate for 30 to 40 minutes. So, there will be vacancy. So, that is why quickly as quick as possible the temperature is raised to the processing temperature at which you would like to anneal. And rapid thermal annealing you see that the time is very very less 100 second down to nanosecond, 100 second down to nanosecond very quickly that is why it is known as rapid thermal annealing. And <coughs> this is the diagram of a rapid thermal annealing you see conventional annealing is done using a, a furnace, but for rapid thermal annealing this is gas inlet and there is a tube quartz tube obviously, this through this quartz tube there is a place where the wafer can be placed and gas inlet means you can use many ambience that means, suppose you want to anneal using argon. So, what you have to do? First you have to start sending the gas through the gas inlet, so that the argon will replace the whole air inside the chamber and then you switch on your thermal annealing system, so that the annealing will be using argon or in argon ambience or you can choose other ambience like nitrogen, vacuum also you can use vacuum, you can use oxygen. But remember that if you use oxygen or if you anneal the material in front in presence of air then what will happen? Oxidize the material will oxidize, so that is also detrimental for our use, that is also detrimental for our use. So, that is the reason that the gas inlet through this gas inlet you send the gas of your choice, then when the stabilization is completed that means, when the stabilization of gas flow is done you switch on the heating arrangement, here the heating arrangement is lamp heating, okay. very powerful lamp is there and that lamp will glow there is a reflector, that reflector will, ref, will not allow the light to go out. So, within this small volume the temperature will increase very quickly. You can put 
10 lamp, 5 lamp, 6 lamp depending on the situation, depending on the rate of heating you want, you can use the number of lamps. And there is an infrared pyrometer or there may be thermocouple using which the temperature you can measure, then there may be a temperature controller, it will control the temperature. If you use a temperature controller, controller then you can make a small programming that you would like to increase the temperature at the rate of 250 degree centigrade per second for 1000 degree centigrade. That means, 4 second will be required from room temperature to reach the process temperature. At that position say 10 second it will stay for annealing and then the temperature will be down to room temperature again. That means, then the system will cool itself. Right? So, in rapid thermal annealing some 100 degree centigrade to 300 degree centigrade per second gradient is used, ramp is used and it can cause wafer defect due to thermal stress. Obviously, that time is very very less even then since the rate is very high, so the impact is very high. But for conventional annealing system, here only thermal stress is involved, no other thing is involved, no contamination is there. Here there may be contamination from hot walls, large thermal mass, costly manufacturing floor space and limited ambient control. Okay, because limited ambient control means if you want to make argon ambience or nitrogen ambience using a conventional furnace, it is very difficult to make and the conventional furnace is large volume furnace. So, th large thermal mass is involved, costly manufacturing floor space means floor space is also large compared to the rapid thermal annealing system, because the rapid thermal annealing system is very small system which can be placed on the table top, but for furnace you cannot make that kind of arrangement. So, these are the advantage disadvantage of RTA and conventional system. Yes, in RTA you see that this is the view graph, you see that I have plotted temperature along y axis and time along x axis. So, say the room temperature is 27 degree centigrade. So, first some time is required for the stabilization, gas flow stabilization. Then you see very quickly it reaches to 1000 degree centigrade, very quickly. It is almost not exactly parallel to the y axis, but delta t is very, very less. For normal furnace, it is the slope is very high and this is the process temperature say 1000 degree centigrade you use to process. Then after processing for say 10 second, 20 second, 50 second, it cools down. Okay, this is the thermal profile of the or temperature time profile for the rapid thermal annealing system. Then one example I shall give and we shall conclude for today's lecture. It is related to our ion beam current which we have used time and again we have introduced the term ion beam current and it is because that ion beam current can be controlled and so the dose can be controlled. Assume 100 keV boron implants on a 200 nanometer silicon wafer at a dose of 5 into 10 to the power 14 ions per centimeter square. Calculate the peak concentration and the required ion beam current for 1 minute of implantation. These are given, straggle is given and projected range is given. Rp is the projected range and sigma p is the straggle. Okay? And uh, let me solve this uh, problem very quickly. You see that one thing is the peak concentration. Peak concentration means it will be at x equals to rp. Peak concentration means it will be. So, if it is say n x, it is equals to s by sigma p 
root 2 pi exponential minus x minus r p square by 2 sigma p square. Okay. So, this is the expression this part is 1 for x equals to r p. So, maximum will be when x equals to r p. So, that means this part will be 1 or it is equals to n x max will be s by sigma p root 2 pi. You know what is s? s is given it is 5 into 10 to the power 14, it is given in the example s is 5 into 10 to the power 14 and sigma p is given it is 0 0.07 micron. So, using this expression you can calculate the maximum concentration, but what about the ion current? Beam current will be I equals to Q Q by T. What is Q? Q is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 and what is T? It is 1 minute or 60 second. Okay. Then what is capital Q? Capital Q is the total number of implanted ion. Q is total number of implanted ion. How it is calculated? It is equals to 5 into 10 to the power 14 per centimeter square multiplied by pi r square. Now, what is r? r equals to 220 nanometer, 200 nanometer that means you can change it into proper value. Okay. So, the total surface area you can calculate and so the beam current. So, that means if the current is decreased, ion concentration will decrease. If the beam current increases, the implanted ion concentration will. So, it is directly proportional. So, you can just by changing the ion beam current, you can say how much ion you have implanted. Precise control of the ion can be possible. Okay. So, thank you.